Hello and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Julie, and I'm speaking with Professor Jeffrey Stone from the University of Chicago Law School. Professor Stone is the Edward H. Levy Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago, and he specializes in constitutional law with an emphasis on freedom of speech. He has served as both the Dean of the Law School and the Provost of the University, and he is the author of many books on constitutional law. He was appointed by President Obama to serve on the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies, which evaluated the government's foreign intelligence surveillance programs in the wake of Edward Snowden's leaks. He is here today to talk to us about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Stone. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Can you start us off with a general overview of your career path from college years to becoming a professor at the University of Chicago? I attended college at the University of Pennsylvania in the class of 1968. That was during the Vietnam War, and there was a lot of conflict over that at the time. The government had previously granted graduate students a deferment from the draft, but at that time, they said only one more year of graduate student deferments. So members of my class wanted to have a graduate program so they could at least get one year before having to decide whether to go to Vietnam or go to Canada. And so most of the men in my class were looking to go to graduate school at least for a year to avoid the draft at that time. I wasn't sure where I wanted to go to graduate school or what I wanted to do, but both of my roommates in college had decided to go to law school. And they told me that this was sort of interesting. I never knew a lawyer and I knew very little about law. But despite that, I went to one of my professors uh, in archaeology and I asked her, do you think it would make sense for me to start a PhD program in archaeology, given that I'll probably have to quit after a year? And she said, no, it doesn't really make sense. So there were a couple of good lawyer TV shows at the time. And I decided, what the hell, I'll apply to law school. And so I did. And I applied to several top law schools. And got into Chicago as well as the others, and basically decided to go to Chicago at that time because my girlfriend had decided to transfer to Northwestern. And I wanted to be in the same city as her since neither of us knew where we'd be a year from now. And the night before I left New York, where I grew up, to drive out to Chicago to start law school, she called and broke up with me. So it was a kind of inauspicious beginning to my study of law. Can you tell me a bit about what you specialize in now, kind of a broad overview for someone who has a little bit less familiarity with law? What is your specialty? So my main focus as a teacher and scholar is in the area of constitutional law, and in particular, involving issues of freedom of speech and press. Um, And so most of my publications uh, deal with those questions, and I regularly teach courses on those subjects as well as others. But that has been certainly the the centerpiece of my scholarship and teaching. And that came about in part because the year before I decided to join the faculty here was 1972-73, and I was a law clerk for Supreme Court Justice William J. Brennan Jr. that year. And this was really kind of the height of concerns about constitutional law. It was the beginning of the Burger Court, just past the end of the Warren Court, And basically all of the law clerks for the Supreme Court that year who went into teaching, maybe eight or nine of us, all spent their careers focusing primarily on constitutional law, because at that time, it certainly seemed to be the most important area of finding a way to create a more just and fairer society. You mentioned that you didn't really even know a lawyer when you were younger. Can you tell me a bit about the types of things you were interested in, especially kind of middle school, high school years, even those pre-college years? What were things you were interested in? And, and do you see any parallels to the things you cared about then to, and what you ended up doing? Well, mostly as a kid and even in high school, my primary interest was sports, both playing and going to games and watching them on TV. I grew up in New York, so I was a big fan of the New York Giants baseball team and the New York football team and basketball team, the Knicks, and so on. So I'd have to say if there was anything that most interested me during that time, it was probably that. As I moved into college, I became much more interested in issues of civil rights and of issues of the Vietnam War because they became much more centerpiece questions that most of the people of my generation became both fascinated with and determined to make a difference with respect to them. And even before that, I guess, near the end of my high school experience, it was certainly the beginning of the civil rights movement and 
with President John F. Kennedy. Uh, that inspired me and many others to be attentive to the kinds of issues that liberal democratic policies could be used to change the world in a better way. Were there specific moments that you can point to that really shifted your your point of view, your perspective, things that really influenced your thinking later on? Certainly, I would say the assassinations of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy had a profound impact on me and many people in my generation in terms of how precarious we felt the state of the nation was at that time. And we became much more attentive to issues of civil liberties, of civil rights, of racial equality than we might otherwise have been, uh, but for the fact that those issues really shook us and made us much more attentive to those questions. And then again, the Vietnam War, of course, uh, had a major impact, partly because people of my generation were vulnerable to being drafted. And most of us didn't understand why we were fighting the war and were therefore opposed to it. So I was engaged when in college in, in the number of protests in favor of protecting civil rights and civil liberties and opposing the Vietnam War, not atypically for my generation, but that was an important part of an awakening on my part to the need to pay attention to the status of our nation and the future of our nation. I want to talk about mentorship and people who have impacted your career can you tell me about one or two or a couple of important people? They could be people who were professional mentors or personal mentors for you, but who are some of the people who really impacted your career path? Well, first of all, Justice William J. Brennan Jr., for whom I was a law clerk, was very influential in encouraging me and other clerks to think about our responsibility in the world and to understand that one of the ways in which we could address that was by taking a serious step in that direction. And when I was a law clerk to Justice Brennan, I was definitely interested in going in that way. I had two job offers for the following year. One was working with Senator Edward Kennedy. In my view, it was in the hope that he would run for president in 1976 and I would be an insider. And the other was with a public interest law firm in Washington, D.C. And I pretty much decided one of those two was going to be my next step. But then I got a call from one of my professors at the University of Chicago Law School, who to this day is one of the people I highly admire, Owen Fiss. Um, and he was chair of the faculty appointments committee at that point. And he called me and said, Jeff, you should consider coming out to Chicago and interview for being a member of the faculty. And I said, Professor Fiss, I'm flattered you would think that, but that's not really the direction I want to be headed. But I've never been very good at saying no. And he called me several more times over the next few weeks. And I finally said, okay, what the hell, what do I do? And he said, well, you'll come out to Chicago. You'll have dinner when you get there with several faculty members. The next day, you will be interviewed by two or three faculty members in faculty offices in a series of 45-minute interviews. And then near the end of the day, you'll give a presentation to the whole faculty about some issue that you think is interesting. And they will then question you about it. And I said, okay, I guess I'll do that. But the truth is, since I didn't really want the job, I decided I was going to be a jerk. And I decided that I would be completely disagreeable in all of my conversations and interviews with my former faculty members and um, decided to present a presentation on a topic that was pretty crazy, which was that heroin addicts had a constitutional right to purchase and possess heroin. And so when I got out to Chicago and came to the law school, um, that's exactly the way I behaved. I was extremely disagreeable, argumentative, contrarian, and presented this rather bizarre thesis to the entire faculty. And all of that was because I really didn't want a job at doing this, and I thought this would be kind of fun. But when I got in the plane to fly back to Washington, D.C., I thought to myself, damn, this was really a great day. I had a terrific time. It was really fascinating. This place is all that it really says it is in terms of being willing to encourage debate and disagreement and open-mindedness. I'm sorry I blew it. And then a couple of weeks later, to my shock, the dean of the law school, who'd been dean when I was a student, called me up and offered me a job. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds great. Even there, I didn't expect to stay very long because it wasn't really my ambition. But here I am 50 years later, still on the faculty. And one of the key moments, I'm talking about people who influenced me, was Professor Harry Calvin, who was a First Amendment teacher and scholar at that time, and Calvin was someone I had taken courses from and was very much influenced by and impressed with. 
And when I started writing my first article during my first year on the faculty, it was about an equal protection question. And I wasn't quite sure that I had it right. And I asked Calvin if he'd be willing to read it and give me his comments. And he said to me, well, you know, Jeff, I think you're right. It's really not all that interesting. But here's an issue you might want to consider. Here's a First Amendment question that I think would be terrific for you to write about. And I did. And that's what led me into being a First Amendment scholar for most of my career. Calvin was someone who was extremely influential in my career. And I, to this day, remain very much in debt to him for moving me in that direction. So it sounds like being a professor and being an academic was not necessarily something that was even on your radar of a possible career path. Can you talk a little bit more about what made you stay once you'd been offered the job? I know you mentioned that University of Chicago was a place where you felt like debate and freedom of thought were really, were really valued. But what were some of the other reasons why you continued down that path? Well, I mean, one thing I learned when I arrived here is that the relationship among faculty members was extremely close and intense and there were constant debates and no one got angry at anyone else, even when they disagreed sharply with whatever their positions were. And there was just this constant culture of engagement and discussion. And it continues to this day at at the law school that I found to be incredibly exciting and energizing. And the other thing I discovered was that I loved teaching. I'd never taught before. I had no idea what I would think about it, but I very quickly fell in love with it and enjoyed the the Socratic method and the interaction with my students. And I was only a couple of years older than them. I was still kind of a hippie. And I just had great relationships with my students. And that was very exciting and engaging. And the truth is, I couldn't imagine at this point a job that would be more satisfying to me. I'd like to hear about any challenges that you have faced throughout your career and how you have pushed through them, persevered, maybe had to avoid them. Tell me about some of the the moments of resistance that you've met in your career and how you've dealt with them. One of the challenges was when I became dean of the law school. It hadn't been something I was aspiring to. And I was surprised when the faculty committee invited me to become dean. And that was a very challenging experience, although I must say the law school was in great shape at that time. And most of what I managed to accomplish were, in my view, making the law school a better place rather than addressing uh, serious concerns or challenges from the law school. But that was learning how to do that, learning how to be a fundraiser, learning how to be a leader of the faculty when I was still pretty young were terrific challenges and very rewarding. The other main set of challenges I, I faced was when I was asked to be provost of the university by then new president, Hugo Sonnenschein. And I never really asked why he asked me to be his provost. But, you know, I I originally said to him, no, thanks. I don't think so. It's not really what I want to do. Um, At some point, I want to go back to being a full-time faculty member in the law school. But we met several times and I really liked him and he was very persuasive. And I finally said, okay, what the hell? I'll become provost. And it was an extremely challenging time. When Hugo became president and I became provost, the university was in a difficult moment particularly financially. Chicago had always been an institution uh, that focused primarily on graduate school rather than on undergraduates. And therefore, the finances of the institution were always challenging. Most other universities like us, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Columbia, had a much higher number of undergraduate students compared to PhD students than we did. And that meant that they were paying tuition on my PhD students. And when they were alumni, they were generally much more likely to be in a position to make major contributions. So Chicago was always at a period of challenge financially. And when Hugo became president and I became provost, that was a major issue on our plate. And the single most important way of addressing it was to increase the size of the college. And that was something that many faculty members resisted because they said, that's not why we came to Chicago. We came to Chicago because it was fundamentally a graduate university. And it took us a long time and a lot of controversy to get to the point where we succeeded in in putting in place a program that over time has significantly increased the size of the college, has dramatically improved the quality of the students who come to the college, and has created a much more positive experience for college students than existed before. And that was a major challenge that required us to deal with a lot of conflict. So that was another major challenge that I faced being here at the university. 
On the topic of roles you have played in addition to being a professor, can you talk about any of the other experiences you've had that are a little bit outside of just pure research or pure teaching as a consultant, as a writer, or some of the other experiences that you have had throughout your career? Well, one thing I've done is I've worked on a number of Supreme Court cases, sometimes writing briefs in those cases, other times joining with others in writing briefs. These were almost all civil liberties cases in which I was defending a range of civil liberties. Some of these involved women's rights. Some of these involved gay rights, same-sex marriage, issues of, of generally civil rights and civil liberties. And that was quite satisfying and challenging. Uh, and I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, I also did quite a, a lot of work in a range of organizations, being deeply involved in organizations like the National American Civil Liberties Union, the American Constitution Society, the National Constitution Center, the American Philosophical Society, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And those were all interesting and, and rewarding experiences in terms of having an impact on the world in a larger sense. So those were very satisfying. One of the situations which you mentioned in your introduction that was very engaging was when President Obama asked me to be a member of the five-person review group that looked at the policies and practices of the NSA and other international government organizations as a result of the leaks by Edward Snowden. Obama was someone I'd known for quite a while. When I was dean, I brought him to the law school to be a lecturer, and I, he stayed here and taught for a number of years, and we became friends, so I couldn't very well say no to him um, when he asked me to do this. And it was a fascinating experience. The five of us came from somewhat different backgrounds, and most of them had a much greater understanding and knowledge of the intimacies of the area that we were studying. But we spent four or five months meeting every week in D.C. and interviewing and speaking with the leaders of the CIA and the NSA and the FBI and a bunch of civil liberties organizations, and ultimately wrote a report that had a significant influence on members of Congress and on those organizations themselves. And so that was a fascinating experience that had a significant impact on important areas of our government. I know you talked a bit about some of the things that inspired you to get into constitutional law and to focus on freedom of speech in the first place. But I, I want to ask about what inspires you now, whether that's working with students or about some of the research you're doing or the writing you're doing. What continues to drive your work? Well, first of all, having been on the faculty now for 50 years, I don't feel quite as passionate about certain things as I did when I was younger. But most of what really drives me is the concerns I have today about individual liberties and civil rights, particularly in light of the makeup of the current Supreme Court. So I've written a number of books in recent years with Lee Bollinger, who is the president of Columbia University. He and I were law clerks at the Supreme Court at the same time, and we've known each other and been friends and colleagues for all of that time. And we've published a number of different books, basically on free speech issues, one called The Free Speech Century, uh, another one called National Security Leaks and Freedom of the Press, another one called A Legacy of Discrimination about the issue of affirmative action that just came out this year. We have another one that's coming out in the fall on the issue of abortion. Roe v. Wade was decided in the year that Lee and I were law clerks at the Supreme Court. And so we've long had a particular interest and concern about those issues. And so mostly I think what motivates me as a scholar these days is my concern about how the current Supreme Court is going to seriously undermine the fundamental rights that the Supreme Court has recognized in the prior half century. And uh, that's deeply troubling to me because I think the Supreme Court should play and has played a central role in maintaining the values of our nation and has done that until recently in a very positive and effective manner, whether it's Brown v. Board of Education, protecting the rights of blacks, whether it's freedom of speech and expanding dramatically the freedom of individuals to express their views, whether it's women's rights and recognizing that laws discriminating against women are unconstitutional, whether it's the right to abortion, which was critical, and many others besides that. This is a court that would not have decided those cases that way had they been the justices at the time. And as we saw from the decision of the court 
this past spring in the Dobbs case, overruling Roe v. Wade, they do not have much respect for precedent, and their values are quite different from those that have led the Supreme Court during all of my time as a lawyer and as a law student to the present. And that's deeply troubling. And, and addressing that in a range of different ways, both in terms of giving speeches and writing, uh, is central to my concerns at, at the moment. What advice might you have for a young person who is considering going to law school or considering an experience as a law professor, um, as a lawyer, studying the law? What, what advice would you have to someone who is, is interested in pursuing a similar career path as yours? So first of all, I would say that people who go to law school, good law schools, Chicago, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Columbia, and so on, almost never regret that they've made that decision. In a variety of ways, it can be very rewarding. As a lawyer and as, a, as an excellent lawyer, as the graduates of those schools are, A, you can make a lot of money if that's what you want. B, you're dealing with highly complex and challenging issues, whether you're a lawyer in a big corporation type law firm or whether you're a public interest lawyer or an academic, you will be intellectually challenged in a way that most other jobs don't provide. And that's extremely rewarding. And I know almost none of my former students over the years who regrets having gone to, to law school, even though they've moved in many different directions in their careers, it's open doors to them that they have very much value. So that's an important thing to be aware of in thinking about whether one should go to law school. But beyond that, it's important to understand that law school, particularly a place like the University of Chicago Law School, is extremely demanding and challenging. And at the core of its culture is that the way to learn to be an effective lawyer is to understand all of the different sides of all of the different issues that you have to address. That is the way that you anticipate the arguments that others may make and the questions others may ask. So Legal courses, for example, particularly, again, at a place like Chicago, are highly Socratic. That is, I spend much of my time in the classroom asking students questions and asking them to take different sides, whether they agree with them or not, because that's an essential part of what one learns in terms of being able to be an effective lawyer. So in terms of being someone who's preparing to go to law school, it's important to develop those skills. And that means being willing and able to listen to ideas that one thinks one disagrees with, even passionately, in order to understand why other people disagree with you. Sometimes it simply prepares you better to answer them and to say why you think they're wrong. Sometimes it may question your own beliefs about these things. And so one of the things I think to develop the skills necessary to be a first-rate lawyer is learning how to listen, learning how to hear, learning how to understand why people disagree with you, and being open to thinking about whether those views, even though you disagree with them, might have more merit than you think they do. At this moment in time, that is a challenge in universities to a greater extent than it's been in any point in my lifetime. And that's very troubling. And I think students of this generation um, have generally become much less willing to listen to uh, positions on the other side. They've been much more uh, self-righteous in their certainty that their views are correct and much more eager to silence the other side than to listen to them. And that's, A, it's very bad for academia because that's incompatible with the core values of academia generally. And it's particularly problematic for people who want to be lawyers because people who want to be lawyers have to be willing to listen to the other side, to hear their arguments and to address them forthrightly and honestly, not to simply disregard them. Now, at the University of Chicago, I think, has been better than almost any other university in the country at dealing with these issues. The Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, for example, FIRE, ranks us number one in the country in protecting the rights of free speech and creating a culture in which students and faculty support that. But that's not true at many other institutions today. And that, I think, is deeply problematic, not only for the, those who want to go to law school, but for those who want to be the kinds of intellects that they should want to be. And I think universities have a real challenge uh, in front of them these days to figure out how to educate students to understand that it is essential for them to be more open-minded and to be willing to hear ideas they disagree with and to recognize that many of the things that we believe in today would have been silenced in the past, whether that's women's rights or gay rights or civil rights or abortion rights or whatever, 
if those views had been silenced in the past, the way people are silencing opposing views today, most people would not have the views they have today about those kinds of issues. Uh, so I think it's critical for people to understand that the way they gain the skills uh, that they need to be successful in life, to go back to a point where you can hear and listen to and address views with which you disagree. Because sometimes you will decide, geez, that's more interesting, more thoughtful than I thought it was. And that's not at the core of this generation's values and interests. And that does make it harder for them, frankly, to be effective lawyers um, as long as they continue to hold those views. What is the most gratifying part about your job? Uh, I know you've touched on a couple of ideas, but I'm curious if, if you can nail down one thing that feels the most fulfilling about what you do. Well, I don't know if I can say there's one thing, but one of them is my interactions with students, which have played a, a central role in my being satisfied as a professor. The second one, of course, is engaging in scholarship and trying to produce work that is not only of interest to me, but that also has an influence on the way others think about and analyze questions, including even judges and justices over time. Um, that's extremely satisfying. And the third thing I guess I would mention is interaction with colleagues, both in the law school faculty and in the university as a whole, uh, which is both extremely challenging and rewarding and engaging. And it's been one of the most satisfying parts of my career. Professor Stone, thank you so much for your time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again, Professor Stone, for your time today. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. Leave us a comment, subscribe, follow, and share this episode with your friends and family. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Stay tuned for more. See you around.